Good afternoon, evening, night, morning, whenever you find your way to see this. Uh, it's me, Omar. I'm back with uh, another podcast, and I have another guest on. Um, we have James from, from Niner Nuts and also from the Twitter account, EJ Perry's Hype Man, who uh, that's kind of how we met. You know, I was doing my EJ Perry campaign uh, from the Ivy League season to the draft. And then later on, uh, he, uh, he caught my attention. We followed each other and had some Twitter conversation. But uh, James, again, hosts Niner, Nut, Nin, Niner Nuts, excuse me. And um, I'll give him time to talk about that and his, and his platform with the EJ Perry twi- uh, Hype Man Twitter account. Well, thank you, Omar. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, and for those who don't know, um, you know, I, I'm James. I'm from the podcast Niner Nuts, and I do the podcast with my friend Dan. Dan is the actual Niners fan. I, I am an Eagles fan, but I bring my Philly passion to the Niners rooting for my friend. I've seen my team win a Super Bowl, but Dan uh, was two years old when the Niners won a Super Bowl. Um, and so uh, my love for Dan was, you know, let's do a Niners podcast. Let's let's watch. Let's have you go through the evolution process of watching, you know, 30 years and watching your team win a Super Bowl and seeing that. So that's sort of how the podcast got started. Um, and basically what we do, obviously, we talk about the Niner news. Uh, however, uh, we do other things like social causes. Um, we've done anti-bullying campaigns. Uh, we've done Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, we've done Mental Health Awareness Month, Women History Month. We've done all podcasted, podcasts that have been dedicated to those things and dedicated to having guests on uh, to provide resources to the community um, based on those things as well. Um, and then every once in a while, because Niner News is slow right now, we've done movie podcasts as well. So every once in a while you get a, a movie podcast. Um, and just recently the last show that we did was a podcast about Inglorious Bastards and how it's a masterpiece. And our next upcoming show uh, it actually has to deal with uh, blood donation and the importance of blood donation. Uh, that comes out on um, next Wednesday. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a Niner Nuts listener or you're new to Niner Nuts, just, you know, be on the lookout for uh, World Blood Donation Day. And we, we will be having one blood on the show to sort of talk about the importance of uh, blood donation. So. James, it's truly noble. I mean, I got to say the the football slash college, the pro football slash college football offseason is a brutal time to for all football fans to really, I guess, find things to do and find uh, stories to cover. But I really admire the way you've covered the time with these social causes and there's these noble uh, humanitarian causes on podcasts and promoting them and, and even movies as well. But more importantly, the humanitarian causes. So uh, it's truly a noble calling. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you know, because, you know, Niner Nuts, we believe that, you know, football is great. Football, you know, is a great recreational thing. But we also realize that sometimes in life there are more important things uh, than just football. And so we give we'd like to give people who, you know, don't typically have a voice, who don't get the news or publicity that they should. And we, we'd like to have them on our show, talk about their causes and um, get the get the information out there. and. You know, so we've really enjoyed having the guests on the show and giving them a voice. Uh, They've all been great. Uh, They've all been supportive of our show and getting the word out for some of our causes. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 definitely fun, um, you know, and, you know, we enjoy it. So. Absolutely. And I mean, again, very admirable, and, I, and I'm glad that you do that. I'm really, really grateful you guys do that. And I'll have to check out your podcast too, for uh, especially the blood donation one as well. Um, so, I guess, uh, oh, do you have something to add really quick? Or? No, I'm good. Okay. No more thanks. Okay, yeah. So, um, going on to our agenda for today's podcast. Um, so, again, like with uh, James handling the EJ Perry uh, hype man Twitter account, uh, he kind of sort of stumbled upon, I guess, this EJ Perry sort of campaign on accident, just tracking the, uh, the I guess, the, the NFL pre-draft process and um, watching the East-West Shrine game where EJ Perry had 
really an astounding performance just I mean, due to the circumstances given where only two quarterbacks got playing time, who's so able to accumulate a, a great amount of stats in this game. Um, so using that, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be ranking the East West Shrine game quarterbacks uh, six through one, and just talking about their pro prospects, talking about their landing spots and their potentials for pro for pro success and uh, kind of like scheme fits as well. And even pro comparisons. So uh, James, do you have any, any, anything to add before we, uh, we kick off and start our rankings? No, I just, you know, I, like I, I, I watched the East West Shrine game sort of, you know, offhand, like, and, you know, I sort of watched it and then, you know, realized the end of the game had come and here EJ Perry, you know, was the star of the game. I'm just like, how did that happen? And then I started watching it again and I started doing research on him. And yeah, I just, you know, I followed, I followed him basically from the Shrine Bowl um, all the way up until the draft and, um, you know, now that he's in Jacksonville. So, um, but yeah, I sort of, you know, like you said, jumped on it once I found out. And once I saw this kid, I was just like, holy crap, he's, he's pretty good. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, as, as you, if anyone, if you guys are no stranger to the podcast channel, uh, you know that I've been uh, trumpeting the horns of EJ Perry since September when they opened the season against Harvard after his great 2019 season, his election 2019 season. Uh, but I guess starting off with the six with the quarterbacks from six to one. Uh, so the quarterbacks for reference on the east side, it was De'Eric King from Miami, EJ Perry, and uh, Dustin Crum from Kent State. And on the west side, you had Brock Purdy from Iowa State, Skylar Thompson from Kansas State, and Jack Cohn from Notre Dame. So we have those six quarterbacks. And my first quarterback that I'm going to rank at the bottom of my rankings and this is no digging these quarterbacks we're just ranking them by just what we've seen and observed as football as pro football slash college football fans and in the draft process but my first guy I guess my number six guy is a uh, Skylar Thompson to be honest with you and I'll be honest I was surprised that the Dolphins took a chance on him as a as a, as a backup slash third string quarterback uh, maybe that raises questions about uh, Tua Tungavailoa's future with the Dolphins even though I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't extrapolate it to that but Skylar Thompson, I mean, it's it's kind of like one of those college football like cult hero type guys where he beat Oklahoma twice in his career uh, when Oklahoma was highly ranked uh, in great upsets. Sort of fits like that kind of stereotype as like a Kansas Kansas State quarterback kind of like game manager. If like you're familiar with the Kansas State program, especially under Bill Snyder in his second tenure, where they had these quarterbacks that could you know run well, but they weren't they weren't world beating quarterbacks. Um, running the ball and then the passing stats weren't great they always had a strong run game as uh this year they are the past few years they've had deuce vaughn toting the rock uh i know today when i was driving back home i thought randomly about daniel thomas you know the the kansas state back from the, from the early 2010s thing where he went but yeah just strong running game and his stats kind of reflect that as well um skylar thompson see just had his stats pulled up there we go yeah skylar thompson's career Never had more than 12 touchdown passes in a season. Uh, the most passing yards he had in the season was 23, was 2,315 yards, even though he probably could have eclipsed that in 2021, um, throwing for, two, for 2,103 yards in only 10 games. But you see, you look at these stats and you think Kansas State game manager quarterback and his scouting report as well kind of like matches that as well, like where the um, after uh, after for weaknesses, the one of, one of the things it has is average passing production throughout his career. Uh, another thing in, in terms of tangibles, excuse me, is over strides and sales to throw, forces receivers to break stride and work for it. So you kind of see that in the highlights, but his strengths are reads coverage on combo routes with timing, resets feet on the move to deliver from his platform, makes great throws on the run and on rollouts. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad pick at all. It's just kind of surprising. It's kind of, it's kind of a reach, honestly, that I feel like they could have gotten Skylar Thompson signed as an undrafted free agent. Well, yeah, I think when you're talking about, you know, who went as draft, you know, that EJ Perry went undrafted and Skylar Thompson got dra drafted, it's, it's quite clearly, you know, like mind boggling. And what I, I mean, basically, I didn't do research on Skylar's stats or anything like that. I just wanted to see how he performed in the Shriner Bowl. And so my notes on him is there was a play in the red zone on third and long that he did well extending. Um he also, like from what I saw, did well staying in the pocket and throwing under pressure just from what I've seen in the game. Not really sure, you know, Kansas State, what he what he had there, but he did, you know, he showed that in the in the Shrine Bowl. Uh, one time he did give up throwing the ball a little bit too quickly when he had a great 
pocket to throw from. Like he had a pretty great pocket to throw from. And he just basically gave up on the play, I think, too quickly and just started running running around. Uh, but he also did make a great fat fade pass in the red zone. Um, but then, like you said, he does sometimes where he leads the receiver too much. Um, and he definitely did that on a throw down the sideline. So um, he wasn't my worst quarterback uh, from the Shrine Bowl. Definitely not. Uh, I think there was a lot of positive. There were still some positives that he had more than um, some of my, you know, then let's say, you know, Brock Purdy, like Brock Purdy at the Shrine Bowl didn't impress me from what he showed at the Shrine Bowl. Um, I don't know where Brock Purdy ranks in your list, but um, Brock Purdy was at the bottom of my list. Yeah, I mean, I'll let you expound upon that more uh, about Brock Purdy being at the bottom of your list, because I had Brock Purdy just slightly above Skylar Thompson. Yeah, I think, you know, basically, you know, Brock Purdy, um, one, it didn't seem like he completed a lot of passes. He only made one really good throw on one-on-one coverage towards the end zone. The rest of his throws really weren't all that impressive. Um, and then he didn't look good under pressure. Like you look, you look at these quarterbacks and what they did under pressure and how, when they got pressure, how they performed. Brock Purdy was constantly getting sacked and constantly under pressure and didn't really do much. And, you know, honestly, he was, he's picked as Mr irrelevant and I honestly think that was a poor pick by the 49ers like I think they could have probably gotten you know somebody better um you know either undrafted or could have picked somebody better with Mr irrelevant and honestly my my hard take on Brock Purdy is as Mr Irre- irrelevant will be that Mr irrelevant will still never throw a pass in the NFL um and I really don't I see him mainly when he, with the 49ers, it's just, you know, he's going to end up, you know, being a camp arm, maybe make it to the practice squad. But I don't even think, I really don't see him impressing, um, you know, Kyle Shanahan um, to be uh, the backup quarterback um, in San Francisco. Um, so Brock Purdy, like basically, and, you know, I know he had a good, I heard he had a good freshman year at Iowa State, but um, after that, it was pretty much like there was nothing left to him. And honestly, to me, what I saw in the Shrine Bowl, I really didn't see anything that would make me think that he could play any anything at the NFL level. So for me, Brock Purdy, he's got a soft spot in my heart. I think those are all, it's a, an astute analysis, James. Um, I guess, but uh, I, I think I think um, for me, Brock Purdy is a, is a great as a soft spot in my heart as a winner for Iowa State, sort of a culture changer along with Matt Campbell and Brees Hall, where Iowa State, he took Iowa State to new heights as a quarterback. Now, whether a lot of that was Brees Hall, I mean, sure, honestly, a lot of it might have been Brees Hall <laughs> I and, think it and was, Charlie Kohler. I think it <laughs> yeah. was Brees Hall, really. I, when you look at like me, like like I said, I don't follow these guys in college. So when they come up in the draft, and I got to do research on the draft, and you know, it's it's funny that you bring up Brees Hall because the 49ers needed a you know running back to add to their running back room, and I was all about Brees Hall. Like if you know, depending on where the quarterbacks were going to go in the draft. Uh, Because if, you know, some people were thinking they were, you know, teams were going to overvalue quarterbacks and just draft a bunch of quarterbacks in the first and second round, I felt that could have dropped Brees Hall right to the 49ers. And I would have loved the 49ers to pick up Brees Hall because he was easily the best running back of the draft. And he's honestly, out of all the rookies, offensive rookies in the draft, Brees Hall is my favorite to win offensive rookie of the year. Um, And Vegas thinks so too, because he's plus 800. Uh, to win offensive rookie of the year and when you look at film of Brees Hall um, yeah I mean Brees Hall I would think that's a good point he probably really helped Iowa State and helped Brock Purdy maybe look good because honestly uh, you know when you when you see these guys Brees Hall has a lot more talent and um, you know so I think I think yeah without even seeing Iowa State's game I could I could probably gain that analysis that I could see people's analysis where Brees Hall probably was the offense at uh, Iowa State and Brock Purdy was just sort of <laughs> maybe a game manager who didn't turn the ball over a lot but yeah I don't I agree with some of that but I want to play sort of I guess devil's advocate to your argument uh, and um, I mean while Brees Purdy is re- or sorry bright Brock Purdy, excuse me, was ranked number five in my Shrine uh, Shrine Game quarterbacks. 
Uh, he did put up numbers uh, to some degree, like especially in 2019. Like 2019, he threw for uh, 3,982 yards, 27 touchdowns, and nine picks. Uh, Iowa State was under the radar that year because they got off to a bit of a slow start. Uh, excuse me. And then the next year, 19 touchdowns, nine interceptions with 2,750 yards and 12 games. Another 3,000 yard year in 2021. He did have weapons, though. I'm not sure. I think I'm not sure where Charlie Kohler went, but Charlie Kohler was a really draft ready tight end. And, uh, you know, I guess, yeah, he was, he was, I think, a Mackey Award finalist for the Cyclones. Uh, looking at the book on Brock Purdy from uh, NFL.com, his scouting report. Uh, and, you know, my computer took a good t- uh, good time to reload this. But uh, <laughs> my scouting my scouting report is, uh, I guess, for, is for NFL, the NFL, excuse me, is his strengths are generally accurate passer between the numbers. Concerns are his passes outside the numbers. Uh and another strength is his running ability. Another one is confident throwing over linebackers in front of the safeties. And you look at a lot of where his work was done. It was across the middle, uh, you know, of course, with Charlie Kohler being a great tight end. Uh, weaknesses, deliveries labored, which that seems to be kind of a common trend among these uh, quarterbacks in the Shrine game is their delivery, uh, especially a guy like uh, Dustin Crum and, and, of course, EJ Perry as well, as we'll talk about later on. Lacks t- they say he lacks time to beat NFL quarters, corners outside the numbers, shies away from the tight window throw. So I guess in a lot of these low interception guys, you do see like less risk in their throws, I guess more makeable throws. That, and I think Brock Purdy is a product of that. But I like the selection, too, because, of course, yes, there is a point that Brees Hall was the heart and soul of the Iowa State offense. But that just makes uh, Brock Purdy a great play action quarterback. And if there's any team that does play action well, it's the Niners with their stable of great running backs uh, with George Kittle at at tight end. I mean, they're a great uh, play action system and Brock Purdy can work into that. So um, I I will say they could have gotten him undrafted. Um, do I like, I would, I would have rather seen EJ Perry or even Dustin Crum, but I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a horrible pick and I think they can work with Brock Purdy for a depth in the quarterback room. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just personally, what I saw in the shrine game, you know, they said he has great mobility. I, in the shrine game, I don't think he showed that very well. I really don't. Um, and you know, I think, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, he could, you know, end up being the third string quarterback, but with Trey Lance and Nate Sudfeld, I think they're going to, I mean, Trey Lance is obviously going to stay there. We still don't know if they're going to trade Jimmy uh, or when they're going to trade Jimmy. So, and then you got Nate Sudfeld there, which, you know, I was an Eagles fan. I watched Nate Sudfeld and, you know, I think Nate Sudfeld, it's just, you know, would be a little bit more better, uh, more better. I think Nate Sudfeld is a little bit better, um, than uh Brock Purdy and so I just you know if they if they trade Jimmy before the season or before the end of trading camp that'll give Brock Purdy a chance to make the roster but I just don't see Brock Purdy beating I just don't see him beating out Nate Sudfeld for the second stringer job so um he'll essentially uh be third string and you know who knows I mean he could get some playing time but very rarely do you see his third string QB come in during the season and you know, I just, I think they're, they may even hold the 49ers may even hold on to Jimmy uh, just in case, you know, Lance gets injured or something like that. Cause they have him under contract um, and they really don't, they're not in an immediate need to trade him. They really aren't like they, they have a good quarterback room and, you know, they're, you know, it's not a bad thing to have two quarterbacks. So, um, so we'll see. Um, but I, I just, Brock Purdy, he didn't, he really didn't show me anything in the Shrine Bowl, but I mean, give granted he played on a good college team in Iowa State, so um, that experience could help him uh, with that, but um, yeah, I just, yeah, I think Brees Hall could make up for, uh, you know, bad passes and things like that, because Brees Hall tape shows that he can make one-handed catches and and things like that, and I think, you know, Brees Hall, um, you know, and uh, probably helped him out a lot so yeah and i will say this mention nate sudfeld i'm gonna mention this for the college football lifers that listen to this podcast uh i gotta say i think uh you know nate sudfeld what he battled time with another he shared time with another quarterback at indiana uh xander xander diamond um you know, he almost he came off the diamond almost came off the bench or came off the bench and almost led uh indiana to an upset victory over ohio state they came uh 
I guess, yeah, one play short on a goal-to-go situation, ended up losing 38-31. I do believe Diamond was always better, the was always the better quarterback than Sudfeld, even at Indiana. I'm not I'm not designated Sudfeld. This is my opinion as a college football lifer, just kind of pulling a memory out. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I guess I guess that's time for I guess that's a good transition for our, I guess my fourth quarterback, and I'll see where you have uh, this next quarterback ranked. But honestly, I have Jack Cohn. Uh, Jack Cohn ranked fourth uh, among the Shrine Game quarterbacks, and part of it mostly is is I of course like the Notre Dame system. Like, I mean, I think it, it's a great system because you can plug and play almost any quarterback in that system in the last few years, whether it be Ian Book. Ian Book, of course, drafted low by the Saints, and I and I mean was a great winner at Notre Dame too. Stats weren't too impressive. You plug in Jack Cohn, a guy from Wisconsin, a notable, I guess, non-quarterback factory, and Jack Cohn puts up solid numbers this year for the Fighting Irish. Which uh, I, I got to look at the stats really quick. I got to type it in. Silly me for not having that prepared. But yeah, you plug in Jack Cohn this year uh, with the Fighting Irish after a couple years at Wisconsin and their running game system, he threw for over 3000 yards in 13 games, 25 touchdowns, seven picks, didn't make many mistakes, but the one knock on Jack Cohn is Jack Cohn's kind of like a Foss. I mean, sorry, that's kind of mean. He's kind of a, uh, I guess, I guess monument to, I guess a pastime in the NFL where it's like, if you're a quarterback, you gotta have some legs. You gotta have some good legs. Honestly, and that's something that Jack Cohn kind of, I guess, doesn't have as a pocket pass. I think like the last, the last sort of pure pocket passer, um, that I've seen uh, drafted recently with with good success, I think is Mac Jones. Even Mac Jones has an element of mobility to his game. Uh, of course, Jack Cohn, some of the knocks before I hand it over to you, James. Some of, uh, I guess, some of the strengths for him is uh, pocket mobile with, with a consistent reset to find his platform. For me, that's kind of like a Dan Marino type thing where you're pocket mobile. But, I mean, outside of the pocket, not, not really <laughs> great. Um, but uh, arm, arm strength checks the box. Obviously, it does in, in a pro pro style type scheme that he ran at, at Notre Dame and Wisconsin earlier on. Uh, possesses boldness to attack tighter windows, something that was a knock on uh, Brock Purdy. Trust the play design with his own arm. Uh, weaknesses, and this is kind of a signal, uh, I guess, a sign for, I guess, how the NFL game's changing. The, the first weakness lacks desire twitch for RPO or the quick game. So we're seeing the growing need for, I guess, the growing use of RPOs in our game. Uh, gets caught babying throws at times, whatever that means from NFL.com. <laughs> um, and then another guy that needs work on his uh, ball placement outside numbers. And that kind of makes sense if you look at the weapons that uh, Cone had in his senior year at Notre Dame. You think uh, Michael, uh, Michael Mayer, the great tight end, great threat up the middle. I mean, receiving core, though, receiving core was great. But of course, you, it makes sense that he was better up the middle than on the outside. So, I'll, what, what's your take on Jack Cohen, James? Well, I, you know, it's funny you say he he's good in the pocket because honestly, that's what I saw in the Shrine Bowl. Like he he has great poise in the pocket. Uh, he also uh, he made a great throw into a tight window. I believe it was triple coverage on uh, third and long. I mean, you know, not many NFL quarterbacks can make that throw into a triple coverage on third and long. Um, and have that much poise in the pocket to do that. So I was really impressed. I was actually really impressed with him. Um, you know, he didn't show, like you said, a ton of great mobility, but he was able, you know, he didn't lose his composure. Like there was a broken play, I think, where, um, you know, the ball came loose and, you know, he just sort of picked it up and he didn't lose his composure on the broken play and he was able to gather himself and make a good decision to throw the ball away, you know, um, and, you know, I think, you know, in the NFL, you know, we're seeing a lot of young rookie quarterbacks and young quarterbacks just trying to make something happen. And you see this, you know, I'm a Philly guy. You saw this in Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz just doesn't throw the ball away. And that what that's what gets him in the trouble. At least Jack Cohn, you know, can throw will make a good decision and throw the ball away. And I, he seemed to do well working through his progressions. You know, you could see that. You know, he sees a guy, doesn't stay on him too long. If he's not open, moves to the next guy. That guy's not open, moves to the next guy. He really, you know, he has great poise in the pocket. And I think, you know, um, you know, he he would make a decent backup. Um, you know, somebody coming into the coming into the game. Um, you know, if your quarterback gets hurt and he's going in Indi he's going to Indianapolis. So, you know, now they just signed Nick Foles and they got Matt Ryan, like he's going to be able to be in the quarterback room with Nick Foles and, uh, you know, Matt Ryan, I think, you know, he has a good chance to succeed. He's also with Frank Wright, 
who was the offensive coordinator for the Eagles when the Eagles won the Super Bowl and uh, was able to help create an offense that not only, you know, Carson Wentz succeeded in, but also Nick Foles succeeded in that led them to the Super Bowl. Um, and so I think, you know, next to EJ Perry is the person who has the most likelihood to succeed in the NFL is going to be Jack Cohn, even though, yeah, he's not mobile, but Matt Ryan's not mobile. Nick Foles is not mobile. So Indianapolis just, you know, they're, they're going to get a, they're going to get a guy who's similar to Matt Ryan, who's similar to Nick Foles, uh, where they have great poison in the pocket. They make good decisions with the football. Um, and I think that's what you're going to get with Jack Cohn. And he has, you know, he has a chance to even, you know, uh, come up, come up in with, Indianapolis, you know, because Matt Ryan's probably not going to be in, this is probably going to be his last year in Indianapolis. Nick Foles really is a career backup. And so, you know, if by some chance, you know, they end up going with a quarterback in, in next year's draft, that quarterback's probably not going to get playing time right off the bat. And you could see Jack Cohn come in and, you know, start next year, you know, I think. And he, he has a great poise. And I really, did like him and I was impressed with what I saw from him in the Shrine Bowl. Yeah, I will say this. I think he's got a strong pro pedigree behind him. It's just, I mean, I guess like um, you look at recent Notre Dame quarterbacks in the pros. I mean, you look at whether it's, well, I guess to start with Brady Quinn, that's the youngest one I can remember. Youngest, uh, that's, I guess that's a guy I can remember from when I was a young age first. Uh, Brady Quinn, Jimmy Clausen, uh, who else? I guess now you look at Ian Book. Uh, heck, even Deshaun Kaiser. I guess the it's an uphill battle in terms of history, but Jack Cohn can definitely break the chain. I think I think fit is is ever. I mean, yeah, fit is yeah, fit is everything. I guess in terms of uh, and you bring up a good point about sort of the Colts using their non. Their, I guess having non mobile quarterbacks even last year too, or not last yeah last two years with Carson Wentz and Matt or I mean not Matt Ryan Philip Rivers. Uh, you know those really stand in the pocket guys. So I can definitely see Frank Reich working with the, with those guys. Um, Cohen will have to beat out Sam Ellinger, which that's not a tall task for the number three spot no, as well. It's not, not a tall, tall task, task at all. So I can definitely see that. I think he's got, again, yeah, agreeing with EJ Perry, he's got the be most beneficial situation in terms of fit. I think uh, his fit is, ranks along with Dustin Crum, who, uh, you know, we're going to talk about later on in terms of fit. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I like I like Jack Cohen, but I mean, my, just my main concern is just pocket passing quarterbacks because, I mean, as a fan of the college game, like, I mean, I, I'm not a huge I'm not huge on pocket passing quarterbacks, um, which, which is why, like, I watch the college game more than the pro game, to be honest with you. Well, I mean, you still got to probably the greatest i mean arguably i'll say arguably the greatest pocket passer still playing in tom brady i mean tom brady is definitely not a mobile quarterback by any means and you know if jack cone you know can you know use his mind you know and be able to read defenses you don't need to be mobile in the nfl you, you the ability to read defenses is everything it's it quarterback honestly is 90% from the shoulders up in the NFL. I mean, it really is. And every quarterback that is successful in the NFL, when you talk about the elite quarterbacks and the ones who win Super Bowls and things like that, they all can read defenses. And it's important that you be able to read a defense. So if Jack Cohn can read a defense, it doesn't matter whether he's mobile or not. If, it, he, if he can read a defense and get rid of the ball before somebody sacks him, that it doesn't matter if he's mobile. He doesn't have to make plays with his legs. And that is still something that people can do in the NFL that, you know, even though we do see sort of this trend in the NFL where, you know, teams are looking more and more to mobile quarterbacks, I still think, you know, typical po prototypical pocket passers, if they can read defenses, they're, they're going to get play. They're going to get playing time. And when they get playing time, they're going to succeed. And in, you don't have to be mobile, I still think, in today's NFL. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree for sure. I mean, maybe it's just my bias as a as, <laughs> as a fan, you know, creeping in with these evaluations. But I guess moving on to our next quarterback and looking at the complete other side of the coin, uh, I mean, I'm sure this might be a hot take in your mind, but at number four, let's see. Yeah, sorry, I can't count. At number three, um, we had Derek Derek King of Miami. That that's my opinion. I guess Derek King, and not so much from a quarterback perspective. While I would love to see Derek King play in the NFL as a quarterback and get a shot, 
Uh, I thought it was kind of um, shocking, in my opinion, that he was signed by the Patriots as an undrafted free agent and then promptly released. Uh, it might still be injury concerns for him because he tore his ACL or was it ACL tear? I mean, I, th- I think it was another ACL tear. Uh, no, OK, it was a right shoulder injury um, that cut his season short and, of course, made the way for Tyler Vanderwall uh, to really go off for Miami and I, I guess, you know, begin his draft, his draft resume as one as, as a pro ready quarterback. But Derek King, honestly, in my opinion, and I'm not sure how much of an NBA fan you are, James, but in my opinion, as a college ball fan, I think Derek King is the Derek Rose of recent college football because 2018 Derek King was so electric. I think in only 10 games played before he had a season ending injury. Yeah, before suffering a torn meniscus, he had 50 total touchdowns in 10 starts and had Houston rolling. And then if you look at the trajectory of that Houston team, everything went downhill from there. You have you had Ed Oliver arguing with uh with Major Applewhite on the sidelines over a puppy jacket. Uh that's something <laughs> that that diehard college football fans remember. I, I remember sitting in my in my in my room watching that and wondering what is going on. Like why is he arguing about this? And it, it, it appears to be over a jacket. And then after that they got shellacked by Army 70 to 14 in the bowl game. But everything seemed to go downhill from there. He had a uh, he had a reemergence in 2020 with Miami. Um, kind of, I wouldn't say a game manager. He had a great year, 23 touchdowns, five picks, 2,600 yards, uh, 538 rushing yards. Uh, of course, counted with sacks as he did in college. But, it, I mean, he just wasn't as electric as he was in 2018. 2021, there were high hopes. But uh, against Alabama in week one in a game that I was actually at, he just looked flustered against that Alabama defense, which might have been a harbinger for things to come uh, in the future, I guess, for his NFL prospects. If he couldn't hang with the Alabama defense, what makes scouts think he can hang with the NFL defense? Uh, But looking at his strengths, athletic, highly competitive, receiving experience with 58 catches from 2016 to 2021. Uh, lower body twitch gives velocity good it gives drive velocity as a boost as a passer excuse me uh, weaknesses too small to play from an NFL pocket kind of the anti Jack Cohen we've talked about requires time to retrain his body for greater explosiveness and on that point too, I think that's the most important point where uh, with two knee injuries that Derek King I guess for him to fit into that role that you as the Eagles fan Greg Ward is filled into Greg Ward of course coming from the same school um, yeah, he needs time to fill into that. And as a 25 year old, it's just hard for people to take a chance. But I think I think Derek King would benefit a lot from playing in the USFL first, even the XFL. And then, you know, like Greg Ward did. Right. Like, I guess the AF and then uh, catching on to the slot receiver and return, man. So kind of long winded way to, I guess, I guess, put, I guess, uh, describe a complicated situation with Derek King. Well, I would I will say this because, you know, I he didn't actually play in the Shrine Bowl. So. Uh, I didn't look up, uh, you know, his film, um, but I will say this. If the Patriots and Bill Belichick cut you, it's basically because they think they can't get anything out of you as a football player. Uh, Bill Belichick could make a football player out of an orange and two toothpicks. And so if if he cuts you, it pretty much means that there's really nothing there that he can mold into to be successful at right now at the nfl level um now maybe now maybe you're right maybe he goes to the usfl or xfl uh, and learns how to be a slot receiver and then you know ends up on a you know making a team on a practice squad and ends up coming up but like you said he's 25 years old so it's going to be hard to really you know mold that into something and it's going to be tough for him. He has an uphill battle if that's the route he's going to go. And it's not like it's not impossible and that it hasn't happened. But, um, you know, if I will say this, usually when the Patriots give up on you, that's pretty much like it. Because, no, I really, Bill, Bill Belichick is masterful at making football players at, basically out of anybody. And, um, you know, I think, you know, that says something that he got, you know, he was signed by as an undrafted free agent. And then Bill, before even, you know, real training camp starts, uh, cuts him. Absolutely. And I mean, that's incredibly sad when you the way you put it, but it is true. I mean, that, that's what I was thinking in my mind, because the Patriots can use anyone and anyone anywhere. I mean, if you remember, like uh, this is like a huge throwback, but like Troy Brown, you know, putting him at safety, putting Julian Edelman at safety. And uh, on the point about him being a slot receiver, it's not that he has to relearn being, or I guess, learn being a slot receiver from scratch, because 
he has a lot of experience as that. It's just the explosiveness, explosiveness needed to be a slot receiver. So honestly, overall, sad situation. And it's looking like Derek King, Derek King will be will go down as like a one of college footballs, I guess, what could have been. And I guess in terms of pro football, too, uh, because we see a guy like Kyler Murray, I can see him being a guy like Kyler Murray, too. Similar size and build and similar game, uh, similar play style. But um, again, uh, just a really sad situation. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you have anything else to add about it, James, but uh, I, I kind of want to move on. You know, it's uh, kind of yeah. kind of a, a heaviness in the room now talking about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can, we can move on. Cause honestly, I, you know, I, to be fair, like I, I just looked up the guys who actually played in the shrine, in the shrine bowl game. So, um, so yeah, we, we can definitely, we can go on to the next one, which is what Dustin Crum, right? Yeah, Dustin Crum, and uh, I like Dustin Crum a lot. Like again, uh, he is sort of the the I guess the guy that a college football lifer like me kind of gravitates to with like everything. Well, putting everything in perspective, like just lay just lay his career out. Goes to Kent State. Kent State doesn't have much football pedigree as we know, aside from I think uh, I think it was 1975 with uh, Jack Lambert leading the defense. Nick Saban also on that same Kent State defense. I think Gary Pinkle was there too, actually. Um, but yeah, all three of those guys leading Kent State to their uh, first bowl appearance against Tampa in the Tangerine Bowl. They don't go to another bowl for almost 40 years. Excuse me, actually might have been the 72 Kent State team actually for that matter. So 72 Kent State. But uh, yeah. So they they don't go to another bowl for almost 40 years. 2012, they end up ranked. They end up, they end up on the doorstep of the BCS, have a great year. Dre Archer was on that team, um, pretty much the, the main playmaker on that team. I think, oh, yeah, also Roosevelt Knicks played defense too, the future Steelers fullback. Just kind of a star-studded team for Kent State. They don't go to another bowl after that for until 2019 when uh, Kent State is 2-6, and six, and literally the turning point of their season was an onside kick. Uh, against Buffalo and they end up winning their, ne- their next four games we have Dustin Crum bursting onto the scene at the end of this 2019 season and he outplays Jordan Love in the in the 2019 Tropical Smoothie Frisco Bowl uh, kind of bringing up the uh, Dustin Crum hype train but of course the pandemic happens Kent State only plays uh, four or three or four games in 2020 but that offense was electric they dropped 70 I think on or yeah they dropped 70 I think on Akron uh, just a really high scoring offense for Kent State and 2021, they continue they continue the moment, momentum, excuse me, and end up going to the Potato Bowl. Dustin Crum was a great year, but Dustin Crum throughout all that probably one of the most electric quarterbacks in the country. You you talk about a scheme that kind of helped like Dustin Crum kind of cook and do whatever he wanted. Kent State had that with Sean Lewis scheme being a great no huddle scheme, a lot of RPOs, a um, lot of I guess a lot of short passes and everything, a lot of positions for Dustin Crum to be a you know on the run and everything. So. Uh, really electric system and looking at his strengths and weaknesses, uh, which again, you know, unfortunate reloading of the web page, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you have here has become very comfortable and efficient in his offense like that it was put in the best possible system at Kent State with Sean Lewis. Uh, hold safeties effectively with with his eyes, subtle pocket size to save launch points. Uh, co- uh, courageous. He, I mean, he stands in and takes the hit uh, as a quarterback. Weaknesses carries football down by his waist. His uh, he has a elongated release. Didn't really have, I guess, uh, a huge like, I guess, a lot of velocity on his deep ball too. Like, uh, kind of hung in the air. But the team that signed him, the Kansas City Chiefs. If there's anyone that's creative, uh, you know, in the NFL with their offense, it is the Kansas City Chiefs. So I'm excited for this fit. Whether he'll see playing time, that is, I mean, that I'm we're we're both 99% sure he won't see playing time in the next couple of years. But with Chad Henney aging, that is an optimal position for him to rise up and be the backup quarterback long term, I think. So I like Dustin Crum a lot. And I think, I mean, he has he is a project with his with his uh tangibles, but he has time to work on that because I mean he's behind Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, and you know, if there's anybody that can get the most out of a quarterback is Andy Reid. That's just I mean, history has shown that Andy Reid can win games with pretty much anybody. Uh, the only the only quarterback he never really won games with that he actually, you know, had to actually play more than one game with uh, was Mike McMahon. Um, back after the Eagles went to the Super Bowl, Donovan McNabb went down uh, almost midway through the season. And basically Mike McMahon just, you know, wasn't anything and that was the only quarterback that I've ever seen Andy Reid not get it anything out of Andy Reid is great at making quarterbacks being in Kansas City is going to be great for Dustin Crum uh you know he can 
he can study behind Patrick Mahomes. Like you said, Chad Henney is, you know, basically getting older. Um, and Dustin Crum, he has great mobility and athleticism. Uh, one of the throws that he make, made in the Shriner Bowl that I'd like was to the tight end in zone coverage. Uh, the only thing is his worst, that was probably his best throw. His worst throw was to the running back that left him vulnerable to a big hit. So um, he probably needs to work on that more. But he definitely, um, you know, we sort of talked about Brock Purdy and play action. Well, Dustin Crum, I think out of all these quarterbacks, even EJ Perry is going to be the best at play action just by the way he's deceptive with the football, uh, just the way he sort of takes the time to sort of make it look like, does he have the football or doesn't he have the football? Uh, I think that it will be great for him. I think he could be great at play action, um, you know, and in Kansas City, he's getting, you know, probably the best head coach with quarterbacks of all time. I mean, there's been uh, Andy Reid, like I said, Andy Reid from Donovan McNabb to Michael Vick to A.J. Feely to Coy Detmer to, uh, I mean, uh, Jeff Garcia. These guys all succeeded under Andy Reid and, and were actually viable quarterbacks and helped them win games and helped them be successful um, you know, be the Eagles teams that, you know, were basically the NFC East dynasty back in, you know, the mid, early to mid 2000s. Um, so if, if Andy Reid can get anything out of him, Andy Reid will, and Dustin Crum is in a very good situation in Kansas City. And, you know, maybe after, maybe after this year, end up being the backup behind Patrick McHolmes and which we, you know, Patrick McHolmes is, has gotten injured. Patrick Mahomes isn't invincible. And so and with the way Patrick Mahomes moves around the pocket and gets out and does mobility, he leaves himself open to, you know, hits and things like that. And, you know, Dustin Crum, you know, maybe next year if Patrick Mahomes gets hurt, we see Dustin Crum coming in and, you know, winning a game for them or two. And, you know, I think he's in a good situation in Kansas City. I'd have to agree. I mean, especially your point on play action too, especially with uh, the NFL, I guess a lot of teams going to RPO heavy. Dustin Crum is one of the best. I mean, was one of the best in college football to do it. If you look at the film, uh, that deceptiveness sort of, uh, and of course uh, with him being a threat as a runner too, uh, having that, you know, I guess the RP, I guess having, being able to carry the RPO to the, to the best of its effect uh, as well too. You look at uh, the chiefs roster, the other, the guy who'll be battling for the third spot, Shane Bouchelle arguably another system quarterback and that's no disrespect to him but you look at his head coach Sonny Dykes uh you know he made Jared Goff into the number I don't know if he was the number one draft he was picker. number one yeah, yeah Goff was number one overall yeah yeah I mean I kind of forget I, I guess uh, it's, it's been a while since I mean he's been around the block it seems like Jared Goff but uh Jared Goff's number one draft pick under in a Sonny Dykes offense uh, had California rolling to, uh, I guess, a top 25 ranking early in the season in, in Goff's senior year. Sonny Dykes uh, worked well with him. Uh, we, we look at Sonny Dykes in a 2012 Louisiana Tech offense where he averaged, or I guess that offense averaged, I think, uh, 49 points per game and uh, almost took Johnny Menzel and uh, Texas A&M to overtime uh, in, when Johnny Menzel won the, won the Heisman that year. Uh, who else? And, of course, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, SMU the past couple of years uh, or with Shane Bouchelle and in 2020 and 2021 where uh, SMU was rolling for the first half of the year with uh, Tanner Mordecai. So uh, Kansas City knows what they're doing with these system guys. They can sling it and spread the ball out and Dustin Crum is no different. And I'm excited to see the fit. I mean, Crum is one of the guys I'm excited to see in the preseason uh, quarterback wise, along with uh, hopefully I think uh, I think. Uh, Felix Harper, the uh, quarterback from Alcorn State, that the uh, that the Cleveland Browns signed. I'm excited to see him preseason, and of course, uh, our guy EJ Perry, who uh, we both have as the most talented quarterback from the uh, the East West Shrine game. And um, like uh, like like I said, uh, if you're no stranger to the pot, to, uh, I guess my podcast with Jackson, you would know that I hyped EJ Perry as sort of you know honestly one of the best of it, like the best kept secret in Division One, both FBS and FCS, coming out of Brown. He was. FCS football's uh, total offense uh, per game leader with over 367 yards per game at Brown. And, yeah. you know, of course, you look at it, the argument is like those are volume stats, which I'm sure as an Eagles fan, you hear that argument all the time with the uh, Jalen Hurts, uh, you know, putting up those volume stats, which I mean, I'm a, I like Jalen Hurts a lot. And I mean, I, I dislike the argument, but I mean, that argument was there in 2019, even 2021 as Brown just 
you know, they, they don't really play defense, to be honest. They didn't play defense in 2021. And I always bring up the uh, the Yale game where EJ Perry had over 280 passing yards, had six carries for 83 yards and a 68-yard touchdown catch. And Brown still lost 62 to 38. But again, you know, bring up the catch. I think the most interesting thing about, about EJ Perry's scouting report on NFL.com is they mentioned him playing a, a Taysom Hill type role in that offense because EJ Perry runs the ball very well. Um, he's got, he's got, he's got a sturdier build too. Uh, and you know, he makes plays on his, he makes plays out of, out of nothing. And, you know, from a comparative standpoint, uh, as an Ivy league fan, Brown had one of the I guess least talented teams in the conference. So EJ Perry was having to do it. I wouldn't say on his own, but he just didn't have as much to work with as the Harvard's, the Yale's, the Dartmouth's, the Princeton's. So again, and, and then of course I'll let Jan, I'll let you talk about it. EJ Perry's kind of like, honestly, it'll go down as a legendary shrine game performance given the uh, circumstances with only two quarterbacks playing. I'll, I'll let you talk about that more. Well, you're talking about a, the shrine bowl, which a lot of people probably don't even know because everybody focuses on the senior bowl now and everybody doesn't really pay attention to the shrine bowl. However, the shrine bowl has a, as a decent amount of history to it. When you look at some of the quarterbacks that have won the MVP, like EJ Perry, we're talking about Jimmy Garoppolo, Jeff Garcia, Brett Favre, John Elway, Roger Staubach, and Dan Pastorini. These are all guys who have played meaningful snaps, have won playoff games in the NFL. Okay. So the shrine bowl is not just some other game that all the all the other guys who couldn't make the senior bowl go to, there are good players who come out of this game. And, you know, you also look at another player that came out of the game. That's not a quarterback, but has a hall of fame career. And that's Steve Smith, the, the wide receiver for the Carolina Panthers. He came out of this football game as well. So the shrine bowl does have some significance with the players that have won the MVP have played in the game. And, you know, even, even if, some of the guys who won MVP, like Mike Kafka, Mike Kafka won the MVP. Uh, I forget what year it was, but he's a coach now in the NFL and he's running, he's running the offense. Uh, or he's, he's, I forget where he's at, um, but he's running the, he's the offensive coordinator, uh, I believe for, uh, if it's, I think it's the Colts uh, that I looked up, but you know, this is a significant game. People do come out of this game and make careers in the NFL and, you know, EJ Perry, yeah, you could say their volume stats, but 367 yards per game, that was 10 games. He only played 10 games that season. Uh, and then, you know, a lot of these running backs coming out of the draft, you know, what's their longest run? EJ Perry has a 94 yard touchdown run to his resume. Okay. And He's going to a good situation in Jacksonville because in Jacksonville, you have Doug Peterson. Now, Doug Peterson is another guy that can make good things happen with quarterbacks. I mean, he he had Carson Wentz, who basically had an MVP-like season until he got injured, and then Carson wasn't the same. Doug tried to work with him, but Carson, I think Carson was more the problem than Doug was. So, But he won the Super Bowl, ended up winning the Super Bowl with Nick Foles, Um and then uh, one, the very next season after they won the Super Bowl with Nick Foles, Wentz went down again. They won a couple. They won a couple more games. They won an important playoff game on the road against the Bears uh, to go to the divisional rounds, and were basically a drop catch away from going to the NFC Championship game two years in a row to repeat as Super Bowl champions. So Doug Peterson knows how to coax quarterbacks, and there's if you even look at the one playoff game that Wentz started. When he gets injured, Josh McCown comes into that game and basically had them in the red zone towards the end of the game, down 17 to 9. I mean, Josh McCown, if he was 20, 23 year old Josh McCown, we basically would win that game. Uh, but he was able to take this 40 year old quarterback who had never played in a football game before or a playoff game before and nearly win it with him. Uh, Doug Peterson is a great quarterback's coach. And I think EJ Perry, you know, is he's in the right hands with Doug Peterson. And EJ Perry could very well uh, end up becoming, you know, the second string, um, I think, in Jacksonville, after, maybe after, by next year. And if he's the second string, we all got to remember that Trevor Lawrence isn't necessarily Doug Peterson's guy, you know. Doug Peterson's coming into Trevor Lawrence. Doug Peterson didn't pick Trevor Lawrence. So, you know, if Trevor Lawrence doesn't, you know, really improve – next year or you go into next 
this year or going into next year, EJ Perry could see some significant playing time and actually come out as being maybe the starter of Jacksonville eventually. Because EJ Perry, he, I believe it was, um, was it draftblitz.com ranked him as the most athletic quarterback coming out of the draft. I mean, his combine was incredible. Uh, he ran a 4.6540, which was faster than Malik Willis at Malik Willis's pro day. Um, he threw, I mean, he threw the ball just as far as Malik Willis. It's just everybody was excited with, you know, Malik Willis's arm. But EJ Perry is more was more ranked more athletic than Malik Willis, and he can make all the he can make all the NFL throws. And you know, he just he has the athleticism that teams are looking for in a quarterback. Um, and the Shrine Bowl MVP is not something to be shooken off. I mean, there's a, there's history to that. And a lot of good quarterbacks have won the Shrine Bowl MVP. Some that have won, I mean, some that have won Super Bowls, playoff games. So it's a significant thing, and people shouldn't just shrug it off as just, you know, just a mediocre, uh, you know, uh, you know, off-season game uh, for uh, college. It's it's a legit game, and so, and uh, you know, understand too, like EJ Perry when he did the interview after he did the interview after he took the MVP award, went right over to the Shriners and was talking to them and all the kids at the game because he understood the importance of the game for them and them being there and what it, what the Shrine Bowl does. And he's just the class act, you know, the more I researched him about him, the more I loved him. Uh, he's only the third Brown player to lead his team, both in off in, in uh, passing yards and rushing yards in the same season. Um, and I believe the 94 yard touchdown run was 10th in Ivy league history. So he has a great resume. I mean, he just, he played in the Ivy League and lost a lot because Brown didn't play defense, like you said. Yeah, I mean, you got that right. I mean, shoot, even even uh, Ivy League outsiders know that Brown didn't play defense. But, uh, yeah, I mean, all the stuff you mentioned, too, I think it's, in it's interesting how you mentioned that Trevor Lawrence wasn't a Doug Peterson's guy. But I will say, I think that given the same circumstances, uh, if he was a coach with, a, I guess, of the 2021 Jaguars, I think he would have selected Trevor Lawrence, too, given that pick. Uh, even though maybe, I mean, maybe he could have worked with Minshew too. It's kind of interesting uh, how I guess it's sort of flipped, how like Minshew's on the Eagles now and Peterson's on, on the Jaguars too. I mean, I do think he could have worked with Minshew too. Minshew definitely wasn't the problem with the Jaguars. But uh, I mean, I think that's a great point there too. If you look at the quarterback room that already exists for the Jaguars, you have CJ Beathard, a guy that I liked a lot. Um, she, I don't even know if I mentioned this to you either in our Twitter conversation, but I mean, as a Niners fan too, I thought he's done admirable work as a uh, as a backup quarterback in, in, uh, in his time. It's just like, that the years that he did play, like 2017 Niners, um, you know, just the the rubble, uh, the rubble that was left over from both the Jim Tom Sula and the uh, Brian Kelly eras, the the very yeah. few eras. That, you know, he he worked with that, and he and he played he played well. wasn't really the problem. Comes in 2020, starts again, starts against uh, the Cardinals on the day after Christmas, and ends up beating Kyler Murray. And I think that was the game that knocked the Cardinals out of the playoffs that year because i mean it was it should have been an easy win for the cardinals but it wasn't uh bethard played well so i don't think he'll beat out bethard but the other guy jake luton who had three starts for the jaguars which uh i mentioned on my other pod we discussed this on, on my other podcast my friend uh that luton doesn't have i guess the uh the sort of i guess the skill set that ej perry does uh, in terms of mobility. And I don't want this to be ej perry gush fest i want you guys to know that he is human so weaknesses are um are a high number of turno turnovers willing to make a low percentage throw, which I think that bullet point is because of his, uh, I mean, you know, because of the team around him where like he had to make those risky throws and, and, and put it up there. Uh, long release is a concern like Dustin Crum, poor intermediate accuracy and ball placement and uh, quick to balance progressions and avoid the pocket as, I mean, of course, as a very adept scrambler. So, I mean, of course he has those things to work on, but again, Jax, I couldn't think of a more ideal ideal situation for a young quarterback to be in, uh, especially young undrafted quarterback to be in, uh, than Jacksonville. So, yeah, and yeah, I was so a little think, disappointed yeah. because he got he got picked up by the Eagles, but the Eagles also invested a lot of money in Carson Strong, so he sort of backed out of the deal and went with Jacksonville, probably because he had a more he had a better chance of making the roster. Because when you have, you know, in the Eagles quarterback room, when you uh, you look at you know, who's going to be the third quarterback behind Jalen Hurts and Gardner Minshew. Uh, we have Reed Sinnott, and now we have Carson Strong. 
And with the Eagles committing more money to Strong than they did to EJ Perry, it was pretty obvious that they were more high on Strong than Perry and were probably more likely to go with Strong. So I don't, you know, as an Eagles fan, you know, I would have loved to have EJ Perry on the Eagles, but at the same time, I can understand his decision uh, to go somewhere else where he has a chance, has a better chance to make the roster. Um, Honestly, this year's quarterback draft really wasn't all that great. I wasn't impressed with a lot of the a lot of the quarterbacks in the draft. And my personal opinion was before the draft that honestly there would be no quarterback selected in the first round, which we know there was with Kenny Pickett, but you didn't see another quarterback drafted until the third round with Desmond Ritter. And um, and so I think that speaks highly that you know this quarterback class really wasn't you know uh, one to write home about. And, you know, EJ Perry could easily become the most successful quarterback out of out of this draft because this draft was just basically like it wasn't loaded with so much talent. It was really it really wasn't anything to write home about. And so, you know, my personal opinion after, you know, seeing all the quarterbacks and seeing them throw at the pro days that EJ Perry is just as good as Kenny Pickett. He's just as good as Desmond Ritter. You know, he's just as good as Dar- Carson Strong. And his potential is, I think his ceiling is really, really high. Uh, what his floor will be, you know, who knows? Taysom Hill, um, they could use him like that. Doug is an innovator on offense. It could use him um, like they use Taysom Hill in New Orleans. So we'll see. Uh, but personally, I think EJ Perry will probably be the most successful quarterback uh, out of this draft. And that's my hot take on that. Yeah, I mean, it- I love EJ Perry, and but I mean, I I, I think I think that that is a hot take in indeed. No no offense, no offense, James, but I mean, yeah, I love his ceiling too. I mean, again, I I love his ceiling, and I can I can totally see him having a sort of uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick type career. And even then, if we want to continue the Shrine the East West Shrine Game connection, uh, you look at Jay Fiedler and another guy that won MVP. Um, of the shrine game out of Dartmouth and who actually had a few playoff starts to his name for the dolphins too. Uh, so, I mean, I can see him having a career like that if we're staying in Ivy league lens, but I mean, I'm just excited. I'm excited to see him cooking the preseason, honestly. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I think, you know, that I just, I think the kid has a lot, a lot of potential and um, you know, who we'll see eventually we'll see if any of these quarterbacks even have make it to their second contract um you know in the nfl and will be a starter after their second contract because that'll it'll be really interesting to see where where everything falls you know by the time you know these guys are uh in their second contract and where they're actually at um because you know i you know and we talked about this you know in in the in the when we were uh tweeting each other in direct message but I really did feel bad for Malik Willis because he was the media hype train. The NFL media hype train had him going in the first round and I, I didn't see it. I didn't think, you know, he was a two-year project. Uh, Everybody's scouting report said he was a two-year project and I just couldn't see GMs, you know, spending, you know, a first round pick on somebody who was a two-year project at best. So I really did feel bad for him. Um, I do hope he's successful in Tennessee. Um, Hopefully, you know, uh, hopefully we do see some of these quarterbacks succeed. Ultimately, I don't want any of them to fail. I would love to see them succeed. Um, but if I'm looking at it realistically, I just, you know, well, it'll be interesting to see, you know, af- who we have left after this, after this year's draft in, in about four to five years. Yeah, absolutely too. I mean, and it's always, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if there's been a quarterback draft as uh depleted, not really, I guess depleted, but, um, not as top heavy as this one and with that has had much success. Like I think of when I think about like sort of bottom heavy uh, quarterback drafts, think about the 2019 draft with uh, Daniel Jones and, uh, and the late, the late, uh, late great Dwayne, Dwayne Haskins, excuse me, um, as, a, as only two uh, quarterbacks drafted uh, in the first round. And then I think about, I think 2013 with EJ Manuel, uh, I think headlining that class as a headlining that quarterback class, excuse me. Um, those are just like the two groups I think of and like neither, neither quarterback class had much, had much, much success or has had much, much success as the jury's still out in the 2018 class. But I mean, the book's mostly closed in that one. So we will see indeed, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I enjoy discussing this with you, James. Uh, do you have anything else to add? No, uh, I guess that's, that's it. Um, guys, if you, you know, if you want a podcast that, you know, 
promote social causes and things like that, just check us out on Niner Nuts. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, uh, those places, and pretty much anywhere you listen to podcasts. So give us a listen. We'd love you. We'd love to hear you. And we do listen to the fans. We have email addresses and we have gear and things like that. So please do not be afraid to reach out to us on Twitter, follow us on Twitter, listen to our podcast. And we definitely love interaction with the fans. So, uh, so yeah, just get to know us and you'll, I think you'll uh, be happy to get to know us. Absolutely, James. Thanks for taking your time. I will have those links to James's channels for the Niner Nuts podcast in this bio and on Spotify or yeah, and in the bio for, um, I guess, the distribution on Anchor, because that's a dis- uh, distribution platform we do use for our podcast. Uh, we'll have those links there for you to, to visit that podcast, check it out, as well as the email if uh, you like what you hear and have suggestions for James. But uh, thank you again, James. It's really been great. Well, thanks for having having me on, Omar. And you know, I'm sure we're both looking forward to the uh, the football season. So, absolutely. I mean, this year has been uh the days been flying off the calendar surprisingly. I mean, it's almost halfway through the year, and uh, football season almost it's it's almost it's almost here. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Until oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and also I don't know if you know this, but um, for veterans, uh, Game Pass is uh twenty five percent off. So. Just so you know, if you decide like you can't record games or you want to watch games, uh, NFL Game Pass is 25% off for veterans. Free plug for NFL Game Pass. Exactly. I mean, that's something I, I didn't know. I mean, I'm not a huge uh, Game Pass guy. I don't even like I don't even like put much stake in Sunday ticket. I'm like, I'll watch what's on TV and uh, get in-game updates. I'm very I'm very old fashioned. I'm, I'm a purist. But uh, I guess <laughs> for those of you watching or listening that are that have served the country or are serving right now. Uh, definitely a great deal to take part of. I know, I know Jackson would promote you guys taking that deal uh, if you were on this podcast with him being uh, more so the NFL guy than I am. Uh, but yeah, I mean, thank you again, James. And uh, until next time, everyone, peace, love, and soul.